Warning! This episode contains some strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Reading the stories that did make it, I'm Hilary D. Bisniaks. Listeners, I am pleased as punch to welcome back to the show my good friend, you know him, you love him, John Wiswell. John, welcome da- uh, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me back on the pod. It's wonderful to come back. Wonder- wonderful to recycle out of the trunk. Yeah, yeah. I So... Like, literally, I saw the screenshot of your pub- Publishers Weekly announcement for someone you can build a nest in, and I was like, okay, I have my book tour guest. <laughs> <laughs> like, there there are some people who I'm just, like, watching like a hawk, you know? <laughs> if you've got a book coming out, if Premi Muhammad's got a book coming out, if Sarah Gailey's got a book coming out, if Caitlin Starling's got a book coming out, gotta have you. That is some company for you to put me in. I'm I'm very flattered. Absolutely. Uh, I like you have consistently your work has consistently blown me away uh with the just the heart that is in it. Mm-hmm. And I'm always if I mean nobody ever asks me for short story, story recommendations, so I just kind of impose them on people. <laughs> But when people are like, I want to read a good short story, I'm like, have you checked out DIY by John Wiswell? Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, oh God, that's, a, that's one that's particularly close to my heart. Um, yeah. I'm uh, also, uh, this. I, I will make sure to get this in the, the show notes for people because I can't get over it, but the, uh, the Japanese cover for Open House on Haunted Hill... Oh, good. Just rules. I love it. It came out of nowhere. Like I signed the contract and then I didn't hear anything. And then just one day, like it just passed through my feed. Like, mm-hmm. like, Wait a minute. I recognize that dad. <laughs> I th- yeah. Uh, the artist was Yu Chan, uh, who did a, just a fabulous job at every, every inch, every square inch of that drawing has so much personality. I love the, the depicting the so whole good. house as a face. Mm-hmm. It's so fun. Uh, all of the manic energy of Anna is is spot on. I I so love that. I um, also like. I've I've been very like slowly, consistently, but very slowly studying Japanese on hmm. Duolingo for four, five. Some amount of time, who knows, time is fake, uh, <laughs> for a while now, many years, and any time I encounter any katakana transliterations, I'm always like, okay, I want to know how, like, I already knew how John was transli- transliterated into katakana, but I was like, how are they going to transliterate Wiswell? <laughs> it just made me so happy. Oh, Awesome. Is, is there a secret to it? Did you, when you read it, did it unlock something about Katakana for you? It reminded me again. So, like, the thing about Katakana, like, one to one maps with Hiragana, which is the uh, character system for, uh, you know, uh, native words, and Katakana is the character system for loan words. Mm. Uh, and. Uh, in hiragana, you have wa and wo, but you don't have we or we hmm. or wu. So you get these funny little combinations that only appear in katakana where they're like, okay, we don't have we, so we're going to use you with a little i. Okay. And it's just, it's very fun to me to see, like, I have, I have these, 
uh, whiteboard markers from Daiso Japan, which is like a Japanese dollar store. Mm -hmm. uh, or Japanese five below, really. <laughs> and on one side, you know, they say whiteboard marker in English. And on the other side, they say, a white board marker. <laughs> and I'm right. just like, every time I see it, I am tickled by it because it's just such a fun language. And like, it... Mm -hmm makes my brain go buzz in really fun ways. <laughs> I really like I really like that how they constructed their their W and their woo and their we sound. Yeah. Uh, Cuz like even it it's not like our language wasn't similarly constructed. When we got around to like, well we need a W. Well, what if you just doubled a U? Mm -hmm. We thingified that letter. Yeah. Uh it, yeah, so everything is just glued together and hopefully it captures something about how we speak. Yeah. Yeah, it's language. It's so funny because, like, you know, I had struggles in school for a variety of reasons, as mm. I think a lot of our listeners probably can relate to, because especially the American education system in any amount of traditionalness is kind of whack and not great for people who have things going on with their brains. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I studied. Spanish in, in school for, like, 10 years, something like, uh, with, with, unfortunately, with a reset right in the middle when I changed schools and they didn't have a placement, so I, I didn't really enjoy Spanish for a couple of years because I was not learning anything. Oh. My peers were just catching up to what I already kind of knew. Yeah. Uh... But it's very interesting to me that, oh, almost more than 20 years after the last time I took a Spanish class formally, I'm like deep into, you know, a, a Duolingo has its problems. It has many, many problems. It's not a great way to learn fluency by itself. It can be a good support tool. Mm. And it's very interesting for me to just like, sit with a language and be like, oh, this is neat. This is interesting. This, like, scratches an itch in my brain in a way that schooling didn't. Mm. That's fantastic. Yeah. I I have never had the mind for languages. It's it's fortunate that I figured out English. <laughs> uh, and, and so I, I envy people the, the power. Uh, but part of my problem, frankly, was being uh, regionally isolated so that there was no uh, place to practice it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I took French, I studied Spanish, I tried to learn Japanese, and it all fell away immediately because all I was ever using it on was my computer or in a classroom. Right. Uh, uh, but I just, I adore it. Uh, I adore the constructions of languages. One of my favorite yeah. podcast topics is just listening to linguists being mm -hmm. frustrated. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I... Uh, before... Uh, for, for like probably about 12 months, I would just sort of like info dump about Japanese <laughs> to my friend and he would be like, oh, that's neat. That's interesting. Uh, and then, uh, we've, we've been watching Hunter Hunter, uh, the 2011 Hunter mm. Hunter together, uh, in conjunction with the podcast media club plus, Hmm. Uh, shouts to the table friends and, uh, sort of through that, my friend decided, oh, you know what? I'm just going to learn hiragana <laughs> and okay. I'm going to learn katakana as well. And, uh, they're, they're totally not learning Japanese. They promise. Hmm. They swear. <laughs> Absolutely. He swears he's not learning Japanese. They're, we're, they're learning Japanese. <laughs> and, you know, now we just, like, we're not conversant by any means. But just being able to, like, toss it back and forth, it's so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. And, like, yeah, that's that's the thing that's really... Uh, that's the thing that makes it, like, I I kind of stopped, fell off studying Spanish when I was no longer 
in a workplace where some of my coworkers Spanish was their primary language and sometimes it was just easier to even if if my own Spanish is pretty uh tortured <laughs> it was sometimes easier just to be able to be like okay I think I can explain this better for you in your language than I can explain it like because I have to wrap my brain around how would you say this as opposed to being like, okay, I'm going to force you to think like I am because <laughs> nobody should have to think like I do. It's, it's, it's weird. I love how my brain works, but it is deeply weird and hard to explain sometimes. You think like you do enough for everyone. Yeah, exactly. I will, uh, I will carry the load of thinking like myself and others will have to find something else to do with their time. Perfect. Yeah. Um, speaking of, of thinking like yourself and, and writing like yourself, uh, shall we, shall we get into someone you can build a nest in? I would be happy to. I've, I've heard good things about this book. Yeah. I've heard some really good stuff about it. Like some starred reviews and stuff. <laughs> yeah. That really, that really took me down to my knees. Uh, the first yeah. starred review was in the library journal, uh, which is the first starred review I've ever gotten. Uh, and one more than I ever thought I would get in my lifetime. Uh, it's one of those points at which this all became extremely real uh, mm -hmm. in ways. Because because the Marsh George publication, I can I can tell you, is uh, constantly being shocked that it's it's realer than it was yesterday. Uh, mm -hmm. We're closer to it being printed. Uh, we're closer to having a narrator. We're closer to the narrator being done. It's up for pre-order now. Here's the finished jacket. Here are the final blurbs. Yeah, uh, and every one of them is like, "Oh, wait, it's real, but it's realer than yeah. it was before." That's weird. People have uh, arts I, I in their thought, hands. Yeah, do these people not know that I wrote a lot of other things that didn't <laughs> become books? Like, why? Is, how is this one becoming a book? Well, John, because of the entire process you've gone through. Oh, yeah. right, yeah, yeah. Weird how you put years of hard work into this. <laughs> yes, yes, and then it becomes the dog catching the car. Right. It's like, yeah. Oh, except the car is cool and wants to go places with yeah. it, right? Like, if, as, oppo as opposed to the dog and the car, I do know what to do with a published book, which is like mm -hmm. be very happy and hug it a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then and then talk to wonderful readers because the early readers have also just been wonderful. Uh, I'm yeah. so glad I made an Instagram a couple of years ago because that's <laughs> where they all are, <laughs> and they keep tagging me, and they're so nice. Yeah. Uh, they, yes, and and people are just there's a lot of excitement for the core strangeness at the heart of the book. Which why don't we get into it now? Yes, uh, yeah. listeners, if you're unaware, someone you can build a nest in is an epic fantasy novel from the point of view of the monster that everyone is trying to kill. Uh, Sheshen is a shape shifting horror, sort of the Medusa or Dracula of her little region. She wants mm -hmm. you to leave her territory alone or else she'll eat your shin bones and use them <laughs> as her own because she has a little trouble with the whole shape shifting thing. She doesn't generate organs and bones that great. Fortunately, in a world of monster hunters, there are plenty of donors. Uh huh. Uh, and uh, so you get uh, this point at which her home is invaded by monster hunters, but it turns a home invasion. It's not a monster slaying, it's a home invasion. Those. Mm -hmm. Those those sons of guns, and uh, they poison her, and they drive her off a cliff. It's very bad. She thinks, "Oh, damn it, this is how I die." And then she wakes up, and she's still alive because this strange lady named Homily has rescued her and is nursing her back to health, uh, and has mistaken Shishen for a human. Uh, mm -hmm. And Shishen does not know how to handle this because she's not used to humans taking care of her. Uh, maybe she'll eat her tomorrow, but geez, <laughs> Homily keeps feeding her. And it's not poison. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, they spend more time together and they go to town together and she's afraid everybody's going to come at her. But instead, everybody's being weird towards Homily. And she comes to realize, like, oh, Homily's mistreated and outcasted in this culture, too. And what, what's wrong with her? I like her. You leave mm -hmm. her alone. Uh, and the two of them start to get closer and closer, but the closer they get, the harder it is for Shishesha to not express the secret. that you There's a misunderstanding you have about me. And I just, I know this woman, this is the one who will understand me. And just as she's about to finally confess to Homily what, what the misunderstanding is, Homily explains why she's in the region. She's hunting this shape-shifting monster. Uh, does Shishesha know where it is? Uh, and that's a problem. That's a, uh, a little... A little uh... 
just just a little bit. Shishesha doesn't take it well. We'll say. Uh, you you can see in the book how how Shishesha handles this this circumstance, but it's it's a challenge. Uh, yeah, it's honestly like. When you were first describing this book, I was, one, I was like, yeah, obviously this is the book that you're writing. <laughs> and, and two, I was like, nobody else, I mean, obviously, you know, you take 18 different queers and they will tell the same story in 18 different ways. Mm -hmm. At least 18 different ways. Yes. Uh, but like nobody else would write this story <laughs> like this is Wiswell through and through <laughs> thank you yeah I guess I did uh, I, a lot of my career has been building towards the skill set to write this thing and it's a lot of my life that I've wanted to be writing like this you know listeners who are familiar with my work yeah I am the guy who writes from the point of view of the haunted house the point of view of the werewolf the point of view of the vampires if he's familiar who runs away I am that guy. <laughs> mm -hmm. I do. I just keep seeing parts of ourselves in the creatures that we other because we are the creatures who others other. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's a common through line, especially among oh, and queer and disabled people. Um, yep. Uh, I just don't only see myself in a sexy vampire. For some reason, I see myself in a blob that needs more bones. Uh, <laughs> which just says something about about me but also the way that uh, disabled people mask uh, mm -hmm. uh, not not masking and socially distancing but masking that they are disabled the uh the try to make your uh disabilities invisible yeah um yeah. for the purpose and, of and to make disabled. them uh if not invisible then at least palatable to the abled's around us right um and one of the great things about both her queerness and her disabilities was that she has almost no internalized uh, shame whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you get to go like the complete opposite direction. We're just, she's a very opinionated monster. She, yeah. has, she has a thick lens of like, this culture is ridiculous. Uh -huh. It must be that they grow their own bones and that's where the sense goes. Like they just, she just does not think yeah. that we have it together. Uh, she, you know, she she dines on uh, sheriffs and other apex predators. Mm -hmm. uh, so she, you know, she has a very different opinion, uh, and that was wonderful. Honestly, like one of the most fun parts of writing the book is uh, yeah. was uh, was letting her really unload on these people who are hunting her. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for real, for real, for real. It's um, in my mind. You know, I, I'm, I'm, we love to sort things. We love a taxonomy. In my mm -hmm. mind, uh, the writer who I, who I always lump you in with is our good friend, Merck. <laughs> who, I'll take that. Merck is know, one of my favorite people in publishing, so I will 100% yeah, take that. They're incredible. And just like, it's something about, I think because the first time I was really exposed to your writing was right around the first time I also read uh, This Is Not a Wardrobe Door. Mm. And that I think you two are both in conversation with a lot of the same things in terms of monstrousness, in terms of understanding the other in a really empathetic way. Uh, and... Uh, and in helping the reader to understand that other in that really empathetic way. And then putting like gross monsters and things. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're not, we're not afraid of biologies. We, not, yeah. I don't think either of us think the human body is as gross as a lot of the rest of our culture does. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I think some of that is that we are queer disabled people who have had to modify our bodies, both in the, both in presentation socially, but then medically to survive. And at a certain point, you just like, okay, I'm going to normalize having a stent then. Yeah. Like I have a bunch of scars on me because I had surgeries to live. I, I don't actually think they're gross. Like when I was 10, I thought they were gross because mm -hmm. I was raised to think scars were something to be ashamed of and hidden and have makeup put over them. But now like, you know, I'm an old man. Uh, yep. And 
I'm, you know, I'm an, I'm an accumulation of anecdotes of survival. That's basically the inventory of my organs. Uh, and I don't feel like viewing them as gross anymore. Uh, yeah. I, I think that that, I think that's pointless. And it also just does a lot of damage to everybody to, to mm -hmm. think that your body must be a certain way because it won't be, you're going to get old. And you're hopefully you get disabled because the alternative is you're going to die. And right, I yeah. tell you, as a disabled guy, it beats the alternative. Uh -huh. uh, and I just, yeah, I, 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 I love that in Merck's work. Merck, Merck also has a sort of, I don't want to say gormless warmth, but it's a similar warmth to, to mm -hmm. the way that I that I inhabit characters. And we're not afraid of pain. We're not afraid of trauma. We just know how to put it into its place within the cosmos of a psyche right uh, yeah and and that's something that attracted me uh to Merck's work very early on um yeah I, I i think like our first several conversations frankly were just at various uh restaurants <laughs> near convention centers talking about like well what if the predator did this uh -huh. uh, <laughs> uh, and yeah it was like oh wow i just i found i found another one like me yeah uh, this is wonderful yeah, you're you are both uh, sickos. Haha. -ha, yes. Dot JPEG at the window, looking in. Yes. Yes. On a sicko on either side of the window. Both yeah. of them. Yes. Yeah. Shackling through the window at each other. Uh, yeah. Uh, Merck's going to be at Fourth Street Fantasy uh, this June, and I'm very oh. much looking forward to seeing them. Uh, Fourth. I've I've never been, but I know from reputation just how wonderful Fourth Street is. It's so the. Every, the the intelligence by square foot is so dense, uh, and there's so, so many different perspectives. It's great to just get like an architect and a psychologist just like butting heads on a on a hard, crunchy science fiction topic on a panel. Mm -hmm. But everybody's like everybody's there in in good faith, right? Um, yeah. Anyway, I, I have great times on programming there. Uh, yeah. And to be fair, though, I am almost Fourth Street's mascot. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a member of their board, but like. I don't know. I'm affable and large and often colorful. So yeah, yeah. I feel like sometimes I should be outside waving a sign. What uh, more do you need, really? <laughs> yeah. It, just You are really one of those people. I don't think we've overlapped at cons, but I know for a fact that like I would spot you from across the main hall at a con and be like, oh, <laughs> there's John. Yeah. And then I will do double handed waving. Yep. Uh, yeah. And then I, I will rush over excitedly and trip over my words a whole bunch. Oh, sure. That's the convention experience. Yeah. Uh, you got to talk to people's faces now. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah. The last Worldcon I was at, I, I had two major, like, writing celebrity moments. One was seeing George R. R. Martin's hat in the center of a crowd of people nice. and being like, Oh, there's, there's Germ. He's there. <laughs> I, I have no need to go over and talk to him. I have nothing to say to him, but I know he's there because there's his hat and I can't see anything else around him. <laughs> and the other was running into John Scalzi as he was exiting the dealer's room and I was entering the dealer's room or vice versa uh, just this very, you know, nobody else in the vicinity, just me and my spouse and John Scalzi going in opposite directions. And I just, like, do this quick double take of, like, is this actually John Scalzi in front of me? And then I just say, holy shit, you're John Scalzi. And he says, yeah, I get a lot. I get that a lot. <laughs> good, good. And I was like, yeah, that's honestly about the best experience i could hope for <laughs> with like you know big names in writing mm -hmm. yeah uh i'm trying to think of like my big names in writing i i fanboyed at uh ted chiang uh, oh yeah that makes back, sense back before i knew or back before i learned just talk to writers like they're people mm -hmm. don't talk to them like they're vessels of their fiction um I was just like, I need to talk to you about the truth of fact and the truth of feeling. He's like, yes, you do. All right. <laughs> and like, he, he listened to my questions, but he was very generous. He was very nice. Uh, yeah. But also, it's like, okay, this is like the Sunday of uh -huh. And what it, 
all right, hi, hello. Uh, he, but he was yeah. very nice. I feel like most of my experiences with authors of of size of renown, they're pretty positive. Most of them are are remarkably nice. At least if you treat them as people, mm-hmm. not if you show up with like ten books that you want to have signed to eBay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 L- authors are. I mean, I I think that us having this conversation is just kind of living proof proof like authors are just people like mm-hmm. you know you you listen to this show i act exactly the same way <laughs> with you as i act with the as i acted with martha wells as i acted with chuck tingle like mm. it's all, we're all just weird little guys doing this thing in some semblance of community you know we're not necessarily all writing together in the same space but we're we're occupying this same thought space Mm -hmm. uh it's yeah it's fantastic the 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 more you interact with authors as people the easier it is to interact with authors as people like Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know it I hesitate to say in the good old days of Twitter because, you know, there's, there's, you once said to me, and I, I have taken it to heart, the best episode of The Simpsons is nostalgia. Oh, yes. I stand by that. I Um, stand by that as well now, but, but I think about that a lot. I think about that a lot, but I especially think about that when I think about, like, reminiscing over the old days on twitter Mm -hmm. but one of the things one of the authors who i ended up forming a a fairly cordial friendship with during those days was michelle baker Mm. who uh for listeners who don't know uh she's the author behind the just absolutely phenomenal top 10 urban fantasy series ever trilogy, the Arcadia project. Yeah. And like, she's just such an incredible person, Mm -hmm. you know? And very easy. Like I, I think I met her in person at a signing at borderlands one time, uh, for, I think for Phantom Pains, mm. uh, the second book in the Arcadia Project, and just like the excitement, the genuine excitement that she had on her face when I got to the front of the signing line, <laughs> it was just like, it was palpable and it was incredible. And it was just one of those things where it's like, oh yeah, no, these are, they're all people. We're all people. Monsters are people too. And, you know, disabled queers are people too. And that's so important. Mm, yeah. I'll, give, I'll also give that series a shout out. Uh, that was one of the first works of fantasy I read where it was very clear that you had a neuroatypical lead and lens that was completely unapologetic. Um, yeah. And also like physically disabled and un- unapologetic, like that opening chapter of Borderline, where a uh, character who will be important comes in and is like, "Will you, will you put all your prosthetics for me?" And our main character has an attitude about it. It's not like, "Oh, of course I will. I don't want to mm-hmm. be a burden." It's like, "F off." Yeah. And I was like, "I, oh my god, we're allowed yeah. to be that on the page? What? Oh, cool." Uh, and the boundaries that exist all throughout that because of of who the character is. He's just, just awesome uh, and, and felt to some degree like permission. Sometimes you read a book and it feels like permission. Um, and I, I'm very grateful to Michelle for writing those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also think this is the second time today that I'm mentioning Camp Damascus, but <laughs> I've the, read that, yeah. the way that Chuck puts his love for being autistic on the page in Camp mm. Damascus, just like, brought tears to my eyes it's awesome it's so good um so this is of course tales from the trunk uh and i know that you know audio audio rights are a bit of a weird thing but i would love (laughs) to ask 
uh, if you have any bit that you would be willing to read for us of someone you can build a nest in, because I know that I am dying for our listeners to get their mitts on this book. <laughs> well, I did. Uh, I did bring. I, I, I'm not allowed to read from from that on audio right now, but I do have an existing piece of work uh, that I think is germane. Um, definitely <laughs> totally original and not uh, plagiarized whatsoever. This is Fantastic. Uh, and it, go, it goes a little like this. Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Hillary. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> yes, listeners, this... Podcast time is very fake. My birthday is extremely real, and it is today. Um, as, as you, I think this made it onto air on the last episode as well with uh, Laura Blackwell. Uh, if if you didn't know, if you didn't hear that episode, I am recording podcasts on my birthday. It was a birthday present from me to me, uh, and also from my dear sweet guests to me uh because this is one of my absolute favorite things to do uh and we did talk about this beforehand so i i wasn't you know i i wasn't going to be uh embarrassed to death by this i found i'm much it's much harder for me to embarrass myself anymore i really oh, good. i really appreciate that spending you know this is the 6th season now of tales from the trunk spending 5 and a bit seasons listening to yourself talk on mic mm -hmm. does so much like i'm not gonna say you know causes ego death by any means but like <laughs> it's uh our friend miri baker says uh kill not that which crin uh kill not that which is cringe kill that which crins it cringes yes and you know that that's another one of those things that i think about a lot yeah, uh, I, th I think a distinct goal in my life was to get to the point where if somebody's saying happy birthday to me at like a restaurant, that I would just spread my arms and bask in it. Hell Not, yeah. Like no cringing. Give unto me the praise for I have survived another calendar year. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, it's more fun to be able to lean into it than to run away from it. Absolutely. Uh, um, yes. So speaking speaking of someone you can build a nest in and speaking of the trunk... Are there any favorite bits that just didn't make it into the final draft that, you know, aren't too big of a spoiler, but mm. that you'd really love for our listeners uh, and hopefully the wider world to know about? Yeah. So so there's a chapter early on that I cut. Uh, I'll say that most of the book stayed from first draft to last most of the chapters remained it was an unusually clean book for me i love that um, for you oh yeah boy i wish uh the next book i was writing was going that easily uh <laughs> but um one of the things i had to cut was literally the second chapter uh, mm. which was a, a giant dump of world building and setting up the rules for how this shape-shifting monster worked. Oh, yeah. And, and giving you examples of like, well, if she encounters... So to her body, Rosemary is a, a fatal poison mm -hmm. um, uh, because she was to some degree inspired by insects. Uh, and I, uh, I... So I wrote this long thing about like, well, she doesn't want to go to town to to get food to try to restore herself so she tries to go after the sheep but they've mm -hmm. figured out how to build these fences she can't get through and all the fences are covered in rosemary she's like god damn it i can't get through all right i guess i'm eating a person and then chapter three is going to try to eat a person um and for a first draft it was a it was a great idea of a chapter because basically even if it didn't stay and it didn't it mm -hmm. set all the rules up for me that i followed yeah. for the rest of the book um and so i i did a lot of finding out in that effing around uh, yeah, and so when it, when it had to be cut later, it's like, oh well, actually, it doesn't do any of the heavy lifting. It did that heavy lifting in the Genesis, uh, and so that's that's a freebie. And I, I always feel like if you have a beloved thing that was useful at another phase, you keep you know you have that junk drawer for that. Yeah, I yeah. might still find a way to take that chapter out and give it to people who pre-order or, or or put it on a website somewhere, just for people who really want to spend one more chapter with Shushesh. 
Um, mm -hmm. it, is, it, you know, it is not plot essential, but you do get to see her be very ornery towards sheep. Uh, <laughs> you know, is is uh, is entertaining to to some. Um, yeah, the other major changes. Um, it's not a spoiler to say that this book has a very long epilogue, an unusually mm -hmm. long epilogue for fantasy. Um, it is uh, to some degree a love story, and I wanted to document more of how ever after works mm. um, and so there are it, it's it's got this long outro but it was originally twice as long as the book you're going to buy so when you go <laughs> like wow this is a long epilogue i like it a lot but it's long it used to be even longer than that now some of that i will say and there would be a spoiler uh about four chapters of that are basically sequel material <laughs> <laughs> um, well, what if, and I think my agent was even like, I think this is the prologue of book two. Like, oh, okay, <laughs> that's fair. Um, so that gets to live on a hard drive. And if I never write book two, well, then those chapters will probably find their way out to the world because anybody who likes this book will love uh, the the cut epilogue chapters. They are yeah, they're so. I, I'm I'm trying to speak vaguely because the book's <laughs> not even out. I mean, by the mm -hmm. time this podcast comes out, it'll be out for a couple of days. Maybe somebody sped read it before they listen to this. But there, there are further complications. Because I'm a writer who loves not just plot, but complications. Love a complication. Yeah. What like we we made a big choice. It didn't have one result. There are many ripples. How do they all play out? How do they affect everybody? Mm -hmm. um, and you get to you get to explore that in in longer form, like a novel, which is something that I that I adore. Um, there are also a few gaps that uh, you'll think I cut out and I didn't. Uh, and <laughs> anything you're like, well, I wonder why he didn't explain that. It's A, uh, I'm of the Tom Bombadil school of <laughs> I just love a thing that is in the world that refuses to explain itself because Hell yeah. uh, I have been a diagnostic nightmare for 40 years medically. <laughs> like I live that uh, some things don't get explained life. Um other things, though, there are questions that, again, I might come back to in a later book that weren't appropriate to come to in this book that the characters right. themselves wouldn't have even asked. But you could imagine a month later, like, hey, what about the like, uh -huh. flaming horse? Which there's no flaming horse. But what about that flaming horse in the sky? This isn't a book about flying horses at all. That is weird. I wonder what was up with the flaming horse. I'm a big yeah, fan of a Tom Bombadil. Book, right? What? That's your next book, right? That's the next book. It's Flaming Horse. Yeah. I just, yeah. just horsing around uh, <laughs> for 400 pages. Uh, yeah. Uh, but those are, yeah, those, so those are things that, that got carved out. A, a remarkable amount of the book just remained very similar to what it was. You know, I, I, the, over the drafts, it was more smoothing out world building, mm -hmm. um, making, making the plot beats a little less redundant. Like, do these three people need to have the same conversation three times? Uh, right, which ha which again, I say you should do in a first draft. Yeah, you cut later. The point is to make a draft that you can work with. Um, but it it was remarkable, and and it is remarkable to me because my books don't usually come out that smoothly. The one that I'm working on right now, which I'm really not allowed to talk about, <laughs> um, is far messier. Um, mm -hmm. and it's going to be an interesting odyssey going through uh the edits on it. But I'm honestly kind of excited because i love those characters too and maybe someday we'll talk about them but yeah. uh but today we'll yeah. stay with shisheshin and homily and hillary yeah um it's it's very uh it's very good always to hear other people to say it and to hear you say it now uh about like it's important to write the chapters of info dumpy world building even if they don't stay in mm -hmm. because i think there's so much you know all, all of the messaging is about when you when anybody talks about writing pretty much all the messaging is about what the final product is going to look like and not about what the messy first drafts mm -hmm. are looking like right and the acknowledgement that not only are those messy first drafts uh an inevitability but they are you know they are they are really important in some ways because like you said like if you write a chapter that's full of all the world building stuff and then cut the entire chapter it's still you did that work in your brain right yes 
and like and that that comes through later um in the way there's something that Howard Taylor said probably more than a decade ago on writing excuses. That's another one of these things that I just think about constantly that he said, uh, and, and which I, I feel is kind of related. He said, you don't have to know how the hyperdrive works. Mm. You can hand wave the hyperdrive, have your character, have your scientist character explain the toaster show them being competent there and then you can write whatever crazy crap you want to about the hyperdrive and people are going to believe <laughs> them because you've showed them that competency that writing this chapter is describing the toaster for yourself right yeah that's a great way of putting it oh that's god that podcast is so good mm. writing excuses is just listeners if you want <laughs> uh probably one of the best podcasts on writing out there like that's it mm. and the it fact is- that they're still running like i started listening i started listening because i was reading schlock mercenary <laughs> and that's how i found out who brandon sanderson was and uh that's how I found out who Mary Robinette Kowal was, mm. which seems wild to me now that I, that, that, that there was a time that I didn't know who Mary Robinette was, but like, mm-hmm. I mean, obviously there had to be a time there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I will second writing excuses is a fantastic podcast. Um, there is more of it than I can consume. Yeah. Um, any given season, I'm like, yeah, this is the one I'm going to listen to all of. And then <laughs> my work schedule assaults me in a back alley. Um, mm-hmm. But I, yeah, and they, they've had a great rotation of guests. I remember that was like the first place I ever heard Maurice Broadus talk. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, who is just a gift. If you could ever hear him talk about craft, he's brilliant. Um, yeah. And uh, Dong Wan has been on a number of seasons mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Dong Wan Song for folks who don't, who are, who aren't like as publishing pilled as we are, where we're just <laughs> like, yeah, we know a dozen of Dong Wan's clients, right? Yes. Well, you certainly, if you don't know Dong Wan, you for sure know some of the people they represent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we we've uh, we've talked a lot about a lot of things that you love from this book if you had to distill it down to it doesn't have to be your absolute favorite because like that's Mm. impossible to pick but is there something that is not too spoilery that you are just so excited for readers to get to hmm the thing in the book that i can't wait for readers to get to that isn't too spoilery right okay like (laughs) i like I love asking a difficult question. Yeah. So like what I'm doing is in my head, I'm holding the book and I'm like pulling more and more pages to the right, (laughs) which is like where you're not allowed to talk about. You're definitely not allowed to talk about that. There's one review that went live this week that spoils like this enormous twist. Oh no. What are you doing? What are you doing? What do you, you know that they're not supposed to know about that. Uh, uh, And so certainly that uh, is a thing I cannot wait. Oh, but that's a spoiler thing, so I definitely won't say it before before a y- probably a year is out from from this because that spoiler is wild. I mm-hmm. um there was it was when I got to that. I know this is not the answer to your question, but when I got <laughs> to that part in my copy edits, there's a note from my copy editor that says that she dropped her tea. <laughs> <laughs> she got to it. Her job wasn't even to enjoy it. She was just so appalled, uh, or so let's say emotionally moved. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> One emotion or another. You can guess the emotion yeah. uh, that caused her to drop her tea all over the carpet and scare the cat. Uh, it could be it could be multiple emotions. Lots. There are lots of emotions that could do that to you. Um, I'm going to say, you know what? All right. All right. First chapter, one of my favorite parts of the first chapter. So basically, these three monster hunters come in and 
to her lair and and Shushan has to try to pretend to be a normal woman to try to fool them into getting out of here because mm-hmm. uh, she does not want to fight three guys she's just woken up from hibernation she's woken up early she's weak um, and they some of them might know what they're doing and they just keep pushing their luck and they won't get out of there and one of them actually tries to kidnap her and use her as bait to draw the monster out <sighs> which is really a great that's choice a for him yeah that's a look that's a that's a choice on his part and um Shishen has up until then tried very hard to be a human and mm-hmm. and do what they, they're supposed to do. But this whole time she has had a bear trap in her chest because sometimes <laughs> you need to bite people. Right. Uh, yeah. And um she gets him to unhand her uh with this. <laughs> and you will and I really look forward to people uh getting to just the end of that and the and the final lines uh because she she's very obsessed with worthy parents that her mm-hmm. dad loved her that's why he let her eat him right uh, and he's and she keeps looking at this guy and is like what like this guy thinks he's amazing he's not a, he's not a father he's not father material <laughs> and then like uh, at the very end, as she starts to devour him, the lines, which I'm very I, spoiling the opening chapter, I feel I can say I look forward yeah, to that's fine. to her going, uh, he swears at her or whatever. And she goes, those were not the words of a worthy father. Those were the words of breakfast. <laughs> uh, and I, look, I look forward to uh, to people getting to that that chunk. Oh, that's lovely. And and to the subject of having the bear trap in your chest, you know, if, if you can't make your own teeth, store-bought is fine. Yes, that's right. That's completely right. Um, that, uh, that reminds me. Now, this won't work in the audio podcast, but Daw, my U.S. publisher, made the most hilarious knickknack. I guess for all pre-orders of the book and possibly for, I think, maybe orders for the first week, uh, everybody will be entered into a random drawing for a coaster that is literally a bear trap that bites your drink. Amazing. I, I love this thing too much. Uh, they gave me one. Which I have used t- too much for an adult to use. <laughs> uh, I have had so much fun uh, with this thing. I'm probably going to bring my one and only one to my uh, to my book launch, and then oh, excellent, uh, give, and give it to somebody. Uh, but it's going to be really hard to part with her because yeah, <laughs> it's my favorite thing. Uh, I need and to that... put it away so that I can be an adult. Uh, uh, that book launch is. Right before this episode drops. Oh, okay. Well, in that case, yes, it's April 2nd at the Strand in New York City. So, yes, I I apologize. Uh, Patreon patrons, if you're listening to this early, uh, I will will try to get it up before this so that you can make it to the Strand. Uh, The rest of you maybe invest in the time machine that shows up on this podcast every once in a while. It's handy. It doesn't cost that much. Yeah. What? Yeah. What subscriber tier gets you the time machine? Uh, I don't know. Uh, fifty k. Fifty k. I like that. All right. All right. Seems reasonable. Yeah. So yeah, I've been watching too much Reservation Dogs. I would make that tier uh, fourteen ninety one. Uh. And that's just for Reservation Dogs lovers. I know at some point I'm going to be asked. Uh, media i've loved and let's just start with reservation dogs is one of my favorite tv shows of the century so far oh Oh, my god uh but we'll we'll get to that later yeah no actually uh speaking of speaking of things that we love speaking Mm. of reservation dogs uh is there any media say uh your one of your best tv shows of the century or maybe uh band whose name you pulled up before we started recording uh <laughs> that you're just super excited about and want our listeners to know about yeah so so within the stress of the last month i have really been clinging to whatever media can cajole me out of just obsessing and refreshing and whatnot uh, mm-hmm. so i i have i have media for you across various forms at first i will vouch for the three seasons of reservation dogs are basically a perfect television show it's about uh basically largely unsupervised kids on a native american reservation perfect um, what more it do you has need? It's so good. Every kid actor is incredible. All the adults at first are like, oh, they're fun foils. And then they just keep growing and their context <laughs> expands. And it's it's a rare American comedy where, okay, so so a lot of American TV comedy in particular is fixated with awkwardness, uh, but it's mm-hmm. usually the awkwardness of trying to avoid humiliation or avoid the consequence of something you brought upon yourself. That's basically every episode of Seinfeld. Right. Um, 
Reservation Dogs is also preoccupied with awkwardness, but it's the awkwardness of not knowing how to do better and trying to figure out how to do better uh, and how to be better. And mm -hmm. how it matures with that theme over the three seasons is un unbelievable. Uh, it's just it's just wonderful. Uh, so that's TV show rec. Uh, book rec. Uh, I just pounded Stephen King's Holly. Uh, oh, which hell is yeah. Yet another Holly Gibney story, but the first one where her name's in the title. And I like a like a weirdo. I picked that book. And I'm like, I wonder what Holly's about. <laughs> oh, Holly Gibney's in this. Interesting. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. OK. It's not about Holly trees. It's not about going to Hollywood. This is about this is about the uh, neurotypical detective uh, with OCD uh, who I who I think is one of his best characters since like his his career is bifurcated before and after the accident it's one of mm -hmm. the best characters he created since since the horrible accident um and the but the thing that really stands out about how about the book holly is uh it is the first novel i've read that is so firmly an exploration of the pandemic uh, oh wow because way too many books are dodging it and trying to set themselves in an alternate reality same with tv shows and movies mm -hmm. uh, where it's just like ah, it didn't happen or like one person had a mask at some point and that's it this whole novel is firstly a germaphobe's take on 2021 like oh. it, she's got a she's going through a lot uh but the whole it, it's because king is so much about zeitgeist of course he had a lot to observe about the zeitgeist of people going into like the second like we need a second booster or we, mm -hmm. we need a booster. We need to get a second shot. Uh, and people who, who think this is about election. Uh, and yeah. all of that being the ground in which someone's gone missing. And the attempt to find the, the attempt to do the tropes of a detective looking for a missing person in a world that's masked, won't open its door, is hostile to random people who they think are coded politically mm. wrong. Is it's so it's so chewy. And it honestly, it felt like uh, an adult was in the room for the first time in a while uh, when I was oh, reading wow. it. Like, oh, okay, yeah, good. Now, I, to be fair, I am somebody who has written some stuff set during the pandemic that <laughs> is also similarly charged, but you know, I don't count myself. And also, he mm -hmm. wrote a whole book of it, right? Like, I, I wrote some short stories and novelettes. Uh, so that's my book recommendation. I'm giving you all kinds of media here. Uh, yeah. Then, uh, in terms of music, so I have... Um, Let's say weird taste in music. The, the <laughs> vibe that I've been going with for the last two years is basically if this would set the mood in an abandoned warehouse where you think you're being followed, that's my genre. Nice. I want to listen to that. That's how I feel good. That's how I kick back. And I, I fell down the rabbit hole on this, uh, this, this one band, uh, Vasios Cuerpos, that just has this great, softly sinister uh, oh. uh, vibe about them. And I just I've been I've been devouring their albums um, they have such great atmosphere um, and it's been helping me some with my writing, but also I, 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 I've talked a lot about it in public that I, I go to horror to relax. And mm -hmm. this, this music has been uh, one of, one of the go-tos for, for that kind of mood. Um, oh, fabulous. Yeah. Finally, a video game, Bellatro. Yes. Uh, have you played Bellatro? I have not played Bellatro yet. I, the only video games that I've played basically since may have been tears of the kingdom which i still haven't beat yes uh i'm i'm just letting it be its own crunchy self mm -hmm. uh and i've i've played about an hour of baldur's gate 3 <laughs> on my spouse's xbox sure uh you know she's played a couple hundred hours of baldur's gate 3 on mm -hmm. her xbox she yeah. bought an Xbox to play Baldur's Gate three, and honestly, can't blame her. Yeah, that's no, that's a fight. That's a good purchase right there. Uh, yeah. All right, so completely kind of different video game is Bellatro, where I, I it's, it's weird, but there's some video games where you don't kill anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. And Bellatro is a roguelike deck builder based on poker. What does any of that? What does any of that mean? Imagine if some really deviant children got eight packs of poker car of playing cards and had no supervision and no real idea how poker worked. And then they got to make up Calvin ball rules for poker. Oh uh, my gosh. It's so wild. Cause it's just, it's full of haunted jokers that do weird things like, Oh, all clubs and diamonds. They're the same. They just, they just are. Okay, sure. All right. That's a rule now, I guess. Uh, oh. And, it is it is so fun it is so simple uh, it's very it's very crunchy it has a hades like uh 
what do you call it, feedback loop, but it mm-hmm. doesn't have any narrative, uh, and it has no character, even though it has strong sense of atmosphere and personality. Because the whole game, for some reason, has a video poker aesthetic, so you <laughs> feel like you downloaded a weird VHS that might be haunted, haunted by the ghost of poker. Uh, and that's but that's all the narrative you're gonna get. And Amazing! I just, I, it is so fun. Um, pure escape is fun. So anyway, those are my whatever kind of media you like. There's a recommendation. Fantastic! I I you were saying this, and I was like, wait a minute. I think in addition to because I'm pretty sure I've I've seen you talking about Bellacho before. Oh sure. Uh, <laughs> but I was like, there's something about this that is just. And I realized, oh yeah, because. Friends at the Table just put up a live stream of uh, a video on on demand on their YouTube of a bunch of them streaming it. Sure. Uh, I bet Austin Walker loves that game. Yeah. Uh, oh, man. Shouts to Austin Walker. Shouts to Austin Walker. Don't know him personally. Have listened to a lot of hours of podcasting. There's few people you'd rather hear talk to you about video games than Austin Walker. Yeah. Or fantasy stuff or what whatnot. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's wonderful. Uh, or he is... he's wonderful from afar. I do not know him at all. I just yeah. admire his intellect. He's uh, super cool as a person to listen to and rotate in your brain mm-hmm. along with the rest of the table friends. Uh I I myself have been listening to the soundtracks for uh Twilight Mirage and Spring and Hyron. Hmm. so much recently because I just bought them on Bandcamp Friday this past week. And uh, my my rule is I will only buy the soundtrack after I finish the season, and I had <laughs> forgotten to buy the Twilight Mirage soundtrack after Twilight Mirage, after I finished it. But I finished up Spring recently, hmm. uh, and at this point I have now consumed every mainline episode of friends at the table <laughs> wow yeah that is i can't awesome. believe it honestly that's like whenever that sort of thing happens with me i'm like i'm so grateful yeah i'm so grateful to everybody who participated in making this thing that i clearly needed yeah yeah uh and so now it's on to bluff city nice and a re-listen of partisan because partisan rips <laughs> What and, a, you brought up that you bought this on Bandcamp Friday. What is the future of Bandcamp? My hope is that the future of Bandcamp is that Song Trader decides that actually they made a goof and decide to let Bandcamp become a worker owned collective. That'd be really that is nice. my hope. Yeah, I would like that. This but we, is, so we don't know what they're going to do. We don't know right now. Okay. I'm, you know. It's one of those things where I'm just sitting here being like, I'm grateful this exists for as long as it exists. And hopefully yes. if it stops existing by itself, the people who have made it what it is are able to make a new thing like it. Oh, please. Because Bandcamp's a godsend. Yeah. I and I love them. Um, listeners, if you don't know Bandcamp, uh, you should. One. Uh, great way to get music by great artists. Great way you, if you, you like, like to own your MP3s as opposed yeah. to just streaming them, and especially if you like weirdo oddball music that you know maybe you can find some of it re-uploaded to YouTube with right. just the most deep fried of JPEGs as a cover. Image. <laughs> but for the most part, like. Uh, uh, the listeners, you won't hear this episode for two more weeks, but uh, I was talking to my friend Ivy on the podcast uh, in real time yesterday, and uh, she recommended a series of albums by a furry electronica artist that mm. you could not find those anywhere other than Bandcamp. Yeah. And like that's that's the beauty of Bandcamp. Yeah. Uh, and on the first Friday of most months, at least, uh, used to be the first Friday of every month. And I think there's like a, it'll be in the show notes. Uh, I think there's a website that will tell you if it is Bandcamp Friday. Yeah. Uh, on Bandcamp Fridays, 
uh, all the profits go directly to the artists. Bandcamp does not take a cut. Yeah, which is the best way to buy music. Yeah, you could not support them better or more cleanly. Uh, Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I love that model. That That's that's like the first thing that I clenched up about when I heard that they'd been sold. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. That's going to die, isn't it? Oh, please stay. Um, And if not, I mean, we all just got to like track down a lot more Patreons and Kofis and whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there are just they're, 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 so many incredibly small bands, even one person music creators are on there. Uh, and you can you can keep them able to make stuff. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's yeah. it's more of the Patreon future than Patreon has allowed in some respects. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not that I have a Patreon. Don't get me wrong, but mm-hmm. like it doesn't do everything, and for musicians in particular, Bandcamp has been an additional godsend. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. It is. It is the most. It feels like a Web 1.0 web ring. <laughs> you know, it, it is the least platform platform there is mm-hmm. in some ways. Yeah. Uh, you know, there there is a social aspect in that you can comment on things. There is there are uh, editor recommendations, or at least there used to be. Uh, yeah. But other than that, it basically lets you gets out of your way and lets the artist sell you their tunes yeah and you know let's lets the artist to a certain extent customize their landing page (laughs) so that you know it looks like the absolute deep fried vaporwave vision of your dreams for one artist and is a very clean minimalist look for another artist and both of them are going to take your money in the exact same way yeah. and send you just some banging MP3s. <laughs> yeah. Well, John, it has been such a delight having you back on the show. Before we get going, where can our listeners find you? Well, thank you for asking. Yes, well, you can find me on this show right now. I don't know if you, the <laughs> listeners have noticed, but if you if you scrub back, you'll hear me talking. Um, it's a great I one. Promise. Yeah, yeah, I heard. Yeah, I've heard great things about this podcast. This episode, yeah. I think, it's doing it's doing numbers. Uh, yeah, um, you can find me on X or Twitter or whatever it is being called this week at Wiswell. You can find me on Blue Sky at John Wiswell. <laughs> I am boring. You can find me on Instagram at John underscore Wiswell. There's a theme <laughs> going here. I'm probably on Facebook if for some reason you use Facebook. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah, it, or or if you're on Reddit and you want to find me, make a post about Godzilla and look at the comments. <laughs> I'll, I'll be there eventually. Uh, yeah, uh, those those are those are the places you, you can find me on Patreon at Patreon.com/slash Wiswell. Uh, you can find yep. me. Uh, I I am still on Substack because I am encumbered by a lot of other things that have prevented me from being able to look at yeah. the newsletter. Uh, landscape so i am john wiswell.substack.com for now i don't know that i'll be staying there but i also don't know where i'll be going because wordpress just completely burned their credibility to the ground in the last week and yeah but it's a thing it's like i gotta fit i gotta turn this book into my publisher i've got to do my taxes <laughs> uh i've got to do some private things that i'm not going to talk about on a podcast and then there's like Look at the news and then launch this book. Also launch this book. Someone you can yeah. build a nest in. You might not have heard about it, uh, but I hear good things about it. Check uh, it out. It's coming out from booksellers soon. Yeah. There are some people who have books might have it. Go look. Uh, that, but uh, like it's basically after that avalanche of life, I've got a, I've, but for right now you can find me on Substack. Um, yeah. And, and if I'm going to move, you will find out by yeah. looking at that. And also all of your socials. Yes, also all of my socials. So, thank you so much for having me. This has been this has been a delight. Thank you for having me over to be a part of your birthday. Yeah, hell yeah! Listeners, stick around in two weeks when my guest will be Ivy Fox for uh, the most five star runtime of five star runtimes this show has ever yet had. <laughs> I think we recorded for over two and a quarter hours. Wow! Yeah. 
Uh, incredible. Rip future me who has to edit that. Uh, <laughs> I, I might end up just following through on my on my joke that I said numerous times on the episode of just posting the raw audio. Who knows? <laughs> uh, and next month for book tour, we're going to be talking to our good friend Victor Manibo. Nice. Because uh, I believe it's Escape Velocity is coming out next month. Next month that you're listening to, listeners, not next month for us here in backwards <laughs> podcast time land. Time is yeah. fake. It's a whole thing. See, if you subscribe to the Patreon, you would have been able to take the time travel back and be with us right now. But yeah, all it costs Too is bad. $1,491. Just got to do it. John, again, thank you so, so much for joining me on my birthday and uh, for helping to make this show the just font of joy that it is to me and hopefully to our listeners as well. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And one more time, happy birthday, my friend. Thank you. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Lillian Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Blue Sky at trunkcast, and I post at hbbisniex. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject.